Hello Kentucky Disciples, I'm Dean Phelps, your Transitional Regional Minister. In the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul does something that I absolutely love. Uh, he quotes a hymn. I love hymns. Uh, you should probably know that, that I'm a hymnal kind of guy. I like to sing from the hymnal. And over the years, I've accumulated a, a small collection of hymnals. Uh, I have several hymnals that, that come out of the Stone Campbell tradition. I do have a favorite hymnal, though, and it's one that was given to me that was published in the, the late 19th century. It was published in the, the late 1800s, and there are a couple of things that, that I love about it. One is that it does not contain any musical notation. It really lifts up that, that the hymn book was, was more than just a song book. It's a book of poetry. It's the great poetry of the church and, and of the faith. Uh, it's meant not just to be sung, but to be read. The other thing I love is its size. Uh, it's, it's maybe an inch thick, oh, maybe three inches wide and five inches tall. I think I'm, I'm actually exaggerating the size a little bit that way. Its design is really to fit in a pocket. Its design indicates that you were really supposed to take your hymnal with you. In fact, in, in those days, if you were going to go visit someone who was sick, then you would take two books with you. You'd take your Bible, and you'd take your hymnal. The first hymnal that came out of the Stone Campbell movement was compiled by Alexander Campbell in, in 1851. It was called Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs. And in his introduction to the hymnal, Campbell's, Campbell says this, the hymn book of a Christian community next to the Bible is the most generally read and much and often read by all true Christians. It is assumed that it does and certainly it ought to contain the marrow and fatness of the gospel and the exercises of the Christian heart on all themes of Christian faith, hope, and love. It is the best substitute in the world for what is commonly called a confession of faith an exhibit of Christian doctrine and Christian instruction. The hymnal, the, the poetry of the church, exercises the Christian heart, but it also exercises the Christian mind. It is instructional. And that's why Paul is quoting a hymn here. It's a teaching moment. It's part of Paul's ongoing appeal for Christian unity, for the body of Christ to, to be one, to be of one mind. How can the body of Christ live in unity? Let us be of one mind. Not necessarily to live in complete agreement with one another, but be of one mind in how we think about ourselves and others. It's a teaching moment. Do nothing from vain ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. And Paul starts to quote the hymn to, to bring the point home. He lets that poetry of the church teach its lesson to, to let the same mind be in this church that was in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus who was in the beginning with God, who was with God, but did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or used to his own advantage. But instead he emptied himself, came in human form, took on the form of a servant, and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And it was in that humility that God exalted him and gave him the name that is above all names, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend on earth and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. It's a teaching moment. How should we in the church treat each other? How should we think about 
uh, about one another? How should we think about those around us? Let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, not finding ways to elevate ourselves, things that we might exploit and use over others, but instead to take on the form of a servant, to, to put ourselves beneath, to regard others as being better than ourselves. It's a, a teaching moment. How should we in the church go about being one? How could we achieve Christian unity in the church? Let this same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus in a time and in a culture when we can really get caught up in status. Let this same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. In a time when it's emphasized that we should be the ones to, to win, that we should come out on top, that we should be number one. Let this same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. In a time when we look for ways to separate ourselves by outlook, by view, by wealth, by class, by education. Let this same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus who did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. How should we in the church regard one another? How might we in the church be one? How might we live out that plea for Christian unity? Be of one mind. Let this same mind be in us. Go. 
God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Would you pray with me? Almighty, gracious, and loving God, we give you thanks that we have such an example to follow. That Christ Jesus emptied himself, came in human form, took on the form of a servant, became obedient. God, by your grace, let that same mind be in us. Give us the, the willingness to empty ourselves, to regard others as better than ourselves. Let us look for the good around us. Let us not act out of vain conceit, but instead, like Christ Jesus did, empty ourselves. Put ourselves in a position of service to one another so that we might truly demonstrate the love that Christ Jesus showed to us. God, let us regard one another as better than ourselves. Let us look to that example as we strive to be your church, your witness, carrying out your work and your mission in this world. In the name of Jesus, amen.